Sadashiva Samarambam Shankara Sharya Madhyamam Asmadasharya Pariyantam Bande Guru Paramparam Bande Guru Paramparam Ah, I'm sorry, I lost it. Can you do today, Lin? What do you want me to do, Sadashiva? Please. Why I have to do it all the time? Yeah, that's right. Sadashiva Samarambam Shankara Charyamadhyamam Asmaracharya Paryantam Vande Guru Param Param Ishwaro Gratmeti Murti Veda Vipagane Vyoma Vadvyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtae Namaha Sarva Vedanta Siddhanta Gocharam Tamagocharam Govindam Paramanandam Sadgurum Panatoshmaham Om. Very nice, much better job than uh, what I do. So you're going to be our, our official uh, uh, opening lady. <laughs> okay, okay. So we have seen uh, last class, we did the, the chapter five. And uh, I want to just touch a few points here. Uh, the Mr. What is his name? Mr. Uh, the three here. Mr. Incosta. Yeah, our guy. Huh? So he he was very inconstant, and he had uh, five children, and all of them, you know, have a lot of raja, and then they they became prosperous. And, uh, and they were there yeah, experiencing the world and getting satisfaction through sense, uh, sense organs, yeah, so sense experience. And uh, the father was going there. So the father represents the ego, like Mark, I think, mentioned last class, or, or, the, or the mind. So it is a nice illustration of him, the father, going to these five different places. Uh, where he experienced through the five channels of of, uh, of sense uh, sense organs, you know, different kinds of experience, and he being the mind, he integrates everything into those experience. You know, the experience has to be integrated by the mind. The, the the sense organs do never experience anything, as we know, because they are inert. So it's the mind or the ego who is going to experience it. Okay. The, the experiencing entity and the experiencing entity does not end at, at that point in the state of uh, a weak state. Yeah? Why? Because uh, not only he went there and he did all those uh, have fun in, in all those different castles, but he took some of those experience home as if he stole, okay? And how so he did steal it? He, he steals it because he takes it as mental, emotional impressions. So he brings the mind experience and, and takes or steal mental impressions, you know? And those mental expressions later on are re-experienced in the dream state. It's the same mind who had had the, those experience and then holds it as if it's stealing from the from the Vyabaharika, no? and steals it and holds, and then projects the Pratibhasika, you know, and uh, experience it again. And then in the dream, he can be there with his wife or whatnot. So this is a piece of interpretation that I want to share with you guys, okay? So that was the, the chapter on bondage. Bondage, why? Because when we live a life totally governed by by desires, yeah? we have the sense organs. They are run. They don't run by themselves. They run because the mind is, is say yes, yes. Let's go here. Let's go there. Let's go there. So the mind is there allowing. So what is missing? There it's missing 
discipline. So you remember the three Ds of Vedanta. Yeah? So we need to have discrimination and then discrimination is going to bring about dispassion. And dispassion all the, as well is going to bring more discrimination. And then discipline has to be there in order that we can control this beast, which is a, a, a desiring mind, you know, without the power to control those vasanas, you know, those sense organs, the organs of actions, organs of reception. So we, we have seen that bondage is a byproduct of uh, uh, indisciplined life. Uh, we will just run according to our vasanas, and then the, the mind being the integrator of the five sense and the organs of action as well is uh, is in uh, is 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 off basically. You know, it's uh, how do you say uh, by is in default. So in a certain mode of default that allows the sense organs and organs of actions to do anything they want without any concern, any regulation, any, any discipline. And then what happens is bondage is the result, of course. So, and, uh, and the destruction and, and total misery, as we saw in the family tree, yeah, uh, in, within this story yeah, <clears throat> presented by, uh, by Hemaleka. Yeah? Hemaleka presented that. Oh, it was Datatreya. No, it was Hemaleka who presented that, right? Of course, she was the one telling this incredible story that in the in the following verse, on the following chapter here, her husband is going to challenge her. No? We we ended this uh, this chapter last week or not? Okay. She said she spoke a lot about her mother. Her mother is, is limitless, uh, Brahman, limitless consciousness. Yeah? And my mother uh, always been with her, which is the case with every living creature. And uh, yeah, in the end, she says, please, you know, go back to the mother, attain the mother. So the, as the only way to gain eternal true happiness, I have now relayed to you, my Lord, my own experience of the pedestal of bliss. Yeah? Very nice. So go back to the mother Tripura, hold on to the self. It stays there because it's the only source of security and true, and, and true happiness. So on the following chapter six, uh, it's going to be on the merits of faith for gaining or attaining the goal. So, and uh, and the harmfulness of dry uh, polemics, okay, or dry uh, logic, dry philosophic uh, discussions, and so on. Right? So the first thing here is the the merits of faith, as we know, faith is uh, one of the the, the base. Now, without which we can we cannot go anywhere. And uh, in this chapter, it's going to show uh, Malika is going to present to Hamashuda the fact that without faith, we don't realize we don't accomplish anything in life, and everything is based on faith. So the faith is the the bottom, yeah? and in the case is is the the base of everything. In the case of the the seeker of moksha of liberation, faith is most important as well. So it, it remains the, the, the discussion in regards to what kind of faith is it to be, is it to be a, a totally blind faith or, or which is a, a faith based on my own uh, observation and analysis? Can I trust yeah, uh, my wife, uh, Maleta, or she, is she trustworthy and so on, you know? So, but overall, Without faith, nothing can be accomplished, especially the highest of all goals, which is self-knowledge. We need to have faith. And uh, as good Vendor teams, we know that our faith is on the scripture revealed to us by the power of Ishwara, Maya Ishwara. So Brahman reveals this, uh, this scripture knowledge 
And uh, unless we have a faith in the beginning, but you see, even this faith that we have in the beginning, it does not, it's not completely blind because uh, most people that come across these, these revealing teachings, they, it does not click to them and they have absolutely no trust or faith. They think like, oh no, this is, is just theory. This is just a uh, uh, philosophy. Uh, this is just mental, you know. So most people they don't have faith because somehow they they are far from understanding the value of knowledge, self knowledge. You know? They want experience of the self. So uh, the faith is never completely blind to my understanding. Because uh, whosoever among us, uh, we are attracted to this teaching from the beginning, we attract because uh, of certain uh, uh, merits, which is based on, on, on knowledge from previous births that somehow allowed us to, to recognize the, the scriptures on Viveka, the scriptures on self-inquiry, the scriptures of the Upanishads as a true, true valid means of gaining moksha. So we have that, and I, we, I trust because something within me uh, somehow resonates and say, wow, I don't know about you, but when I got in contact with uh, Vedanta, it was like, wow, now I, I got to my destination. That is the body of knowledge that's going to clear whatsoever last bits and pieces of doubt and confusion, you understand? So, but without this faith, but this faith is not completely uh, blind and it cannot be uh, somehow faked, okay? And uh, at the end, it's all about karma, it's all about merits. And here we are going to look the merits of faith. So it comes from karma, it comes from part effort, part life that in, by which we, we, we developed this, this value for self-knowledge. You know? Uh, the first verse says, Hamashuda was astonished at the fantastic tale of his beloved wife. Being ignorant, he smiled, desired derisively at the tale and asked, asked that wise, he asked that wise princess. Okay, so he approached her asking this question. My dear, what you have been saying seems to be nothing but invention. Your, your words have no relation to facts and are altogether meaningless. Uh, you are certainly the daughter of uh, the celestial damsel as you have described in the past. And uh, you were brought up by your father, the great Rish Vyagrapada in the forest. And, uh, and you were very young. There is no, by, by no means, there's no way you could have gone through all those generations and generations of experience that you described in your tale. Huh? But you talk as if you were several generations old. Your long-winded speech is like that of a girl possessed, not in her sense. So he, Right from the beginning, he somehow has a, a reaction that uh, to a certain degree is a little bit surprising because uh, one would expect that he would be a little bit more qualified since he has already developed some dispassion. He understood the initial teachings of Hamaleka and he developed already dispassion. He was not going back again to the, the sense pleasure world. You know, and he was withdrawing and he was putting up a fight with his vasana. So he, he could have had already a certain uh, a shraddha developed towards his wife. But the story was such that went over his head. He could not see the symbolism and connect the dots. Okay. So I cannot believe this story. Tell me where your companion is. So show me the proofs, you know. And this, what is this sons that were killed in the end? Uh, the sun. Where are those cities? What is the significance of your story? Where is your girlfriend? Uh, tell me quickly. I know nothing of your lady in waiting. 
you may ask my mother if you like it. So the mother is the queen. There is no other late in the, in the kingdom, no? besides your mother-in-law and my father, there is nobody. So, I mean, you have to prove your words, otherwise you're going to be ridiculed by your very husband here because you lost your mind. Tell me quickly where such a lady is to be found and where are the sons and where her sons are. I think your tale is a myth like the tale of a barren woman's son. So the famous barren woman, son, huh, that go about having all kinds of experience and then describing its experience, making a big scene. And the whole basis of it is, uh, is baseless because he could never ever be born if the mother was a barren woman. Yeah? So likewise, yeah, a lot of people play with uh, uh, with academic knowledge yeah, of the scriptures, and somehow those uh, those words do not mean much. Okay, so it's 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 not founded in in something such as uh, uh, discrimination, dispassion. It's just more and more, you know, arguments and logic, pure logic, dry logic. So from that from that angle as well. So you were like a, a barren uh, a person trying to, try to benefit from this self-knowledge, but uh, the base uh, are not there. So the base definite, to my understanding here, is uh, discrimination and dispassion and discipline by which you can really uh, uh, go into the process of shravana, manana, nididhyasana. Yeah? And, uh, and and then get the fruits, you know, enjoy the fruits of self-knowledge. But this seems to be like a, a story of a clown once related that the bear woman's son mount the chariot reflecting a mirror. So we have a bear woman that gives birth to someone and then there is a chariot which was reflecting a mirror or, or in a lake. And then the whole story goes from there. Yeah? And he, he he tells all these stories and there are no base to it. You know, it, when I read it today, I, I read this today and I read also the Portuguese so that I don't need to be lost you know, with these English words. So it, it reminded me, it gave me this picture of these people who go about uh, with academic uh, knowledge, you know, and but uh, but it, it means nothing, you know? It's just uh, the foundation is not there. Foundation is uh, is something else, you know. It's, it begins actually with uh, trust in God, trust in Shwara, trust in the scriptures, devotion. Everything that uh, we go through in Karma, Dharma, Yoga is the foundation actually. And then discrimination is there even for the Karma Yoga phase and so on. And then we can, we can enjoy the fruits of self-knowledge. Otherwise, it's just like a fiction. Yeah? Uh, I take your words to mean something similar, like a fiction, with the, without any base or foundation. It cannot be true. After listening to the words of her lover, the wise wife continued. Lord, how can you say that my parable is meaningless. Words from the lips of those like me can never be nonsense. Yeah? So she immediately she goes, and now she's not, you know, uh, sugarcoating much his her words. He's just say, how can you not trust me by this point? You know, I have already conveyed you some knowledge. I have showed you who I am by my very uh, behavior, yeah, my actions and words. So how can you, you believe that I have been saying nonsense here? No? Falsehood undermines the effects of one's penance. So how can it be suspect in virtuous people? I am a, a virtuous people. And now you're telling me that I'm a liar, no? that uh, I'm spreading false narratives or fake news or fake stories. No? So how can you suspect someone so as virtuous as myself? So how can such a one be stainless and numbered 
among the sages. So if you are there among the sages, you must be stainless and you definitely, you don't spread lies. So it's just the lack, uh, Emma Shuda, to, to connect the dots and, uh, and understand the teachings there, which actually is profound as we could see, yeah? to, to get the symbolism and interpret correctly. So it requires uh, uh, the unfoldment of a teacher. No? And she just presented like that without unfolding. Then it's somewhat, somewhat a little bit understandable that he was a little bit lost to understand the meaning of, of that story. You know? Moreover, one who entertains an earnest seeker with uh, false words will not prosper in this world nor advance in the next. Listen, Prince, a poor blind man cannot have his eyesight restored by merely hearing the prescription read. So now she talks about something here. So there is a, a man, he has a eyesight problem and, uh, and he wants to restore his eyesight, but it's not enough to hear the prescription yeah, because he is blind at that point and not go to the pharmacy and buy the prescription and take the prescription drug, you know? And uh, so it's not going, so you have to, you have to listen, you know? And then you have to, to assimilate, assimilate the prescriptions and, and apply the prescription so that you can be benefit, you know? So uh, there is a story of someone who went to the doctor with a similar problem. And then, uh, and then the doctor gave the person a prescription you know, to the blind man and say, okay, take it home, go home and take it, okay? So it was an angel, of course. The guy went home. He did not want. He did not know what to do with it, and he shocked it fine. And they put it in the shapach, and then he took it. And then, uh, and then he got much worse. And then, uh, and then uh, he went back to the doctor. Said, "But why are you so bad?" I said, "Did you do what I said? Did you take?" "Yes, I take it. I put it in the shapach and I took it, and it was not bad." So no, you need to know how to 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 take it, how to yeah to integrate, yeah, to digest these teachings to He's a fool who misjudges good precepts for falsehood. So yes, so you were being a fool. So your Viveka is, is poor at this point. So you are misjudging me, you know? And uh, even though I have given proofs of wisdom to you, do you think, my dear, that I, your wife, would deceive you with a myth when you are so much in earnest? So she, she recognized that he is an earnest seeker. And she said, I would never do that to anybody, much less to you, my husband, who is a very earnest person. Reason well and carefully examine this suspect untruths of mind. Is not an intelligent man accustomed to judge big things in the world by verifying a few details in them? I now present to you my credentials. So she's saying again, huh? <clears throat> revise your assumption that I'm being untruthful and I am telling lies. Every intelligent person has to use its discrimination and uh, observe events and then judge for himself, herself uh, by observing the details, okay? So watch, watch the others, watch circumstances and events and try to read it uh, the best possible way according to your, your judgment, to your Viveka possibilities. Huh? So, and then she says, so, Revise your assumption, and I'm going to present you now my credentials. Some things used to please you before. So now she's going to present her credential. One would think that I say, okay, those are my credentials, my father, my mother, my accomplishment in life, my resume, and so on. She said, no, I'm going to present you my credentials. And then she goes and presents to him what she is, what she has done, to him so far. Yeah? <clears throat> Some things used to please you before, but after 
I I present myself with uh, with wisdom, yeah, they cease to to please you. Yeah? So you heard me, you understood. So I, I, this is my credential, for example. No, my words brought about this passion had a positive impact, you know, strong impact on you. They are similarly bound to do so even more in the future if you let it in, if you, if you, you know, give away these false assumptions about myself and my true intentions and my true credentials. I'm a pure person, a, a wise woman who is here to teach you. Huh? So how else can it be? Judge your own statements from facts, not you know your misunderstanding, so misjudgment. Judge it based on facts. Okay, what are the facts? So my wife has been here. She's my guru. And she has presented me a, a lot of wisdom that I was not aware of. I have benefited by it. And that's exactly the way we go about with Vedanta, with the scriptures. We see what we have gained so far, you understand? And then we say, no, no, I mean, Vedanta's credential is unbelievable. I have got a little bit, but I want more, but I trust it, okay? And, uh, oh, but I'm, I don't understand this, I don't understand that. There are contradictions. Take it easy, wait, okay? Trust, because these contradictions are going to be resolved by and by as you, you assimilate and integrate these teachings. Yeah? So, but we are based on what we have to base our judgment from on what we already gained by this good association, his good association with the Maleka, our good association with the scriptures. And then we keep basing our judgment. Yeah? Every time we encounter absurdities or, or, or paradox or contradictions in the teachings that we know that they emerge in the mind of the seekers. Huh? <clears throat> or even when they, they start going, a lot of people going to go here, oh, no, I'm a Vedanta, but they keep going back to what they used to do before, comparing different philosophies, different schools, and then they, they never really develop a, a trust uh, complete trust because they they keep confused by holding holding uh, uh, their doubts in comparison with what before was taken by them as the truth you know and so on so we see this but here she says so much more is waiting for you listen to me king with an unsophisticated and clear intellect mistrust in a well wishes words is the surest way to ruin. So now she, she says that uh, mistrust is something that can destroy a person. Mistrust is lack of shraddha. So if we don't have this fundamental qualification that very often I present, not we see the, the disciplines, but I present as a qualification for Vedanta, which is there, must be there in the beginning, because everything is so new, it's so like, you see that there is some light there, but you have to trust the process, trust the scripture and the teacher and so on. Listen to me, with an unsophisticated and clear intellect, it's interesting that she throws this word there, unsophisticated, because she means to say, leave your, your, your clever, smart, you know, mind aside, you know, keep your mind clear, the intellect should be clear, but uh, the sophistication of dry philosophy, dry arguments has to be put aside, you know, because we could say, no, no, the, the, the intellect has to be sophisticated to, to approach Vedanta. No, it's more like the intellect has to be clear and pure. There is so much sophistication in the world, in the academic world of, uh, of uh, of scriptural knowledge, you understand? I mean, we can see discussions of some of these bandits in some, uh, you know, they can be hair splitting uh, arguments, but still, you know, a lot of sophistication in terms of uh, a, a logic there. But uh, this is not the most important. The most important is a pure heart, a pure mind, and clear, uh, with the trust, 
without trust, we don't grow well, as we know. Trust in Shwara, trust in Brahman and the scriptures revealed by Brahman. Otherwise, it's this is the surest way to ruin. Faith is like a found mother who can never fail to save her trusting son from dangerous situations. There is no doubt about it. I, I believe that uh, the trust that everybody has in one's mother is, is the most uh, fundamental base of, uh, of one's life, uh, one's personality or character. So if we somehow we don't have faith in the mother, yeah, the individual will always be weak you know, and, and disturbed. So most people who, who are uh, abandoned and never got to know the mother. And so it's, it's so basic to have that trust in one's uh, mother and father, you understand? So <clears throat> without that, it's difficult to, to, to be a health, prosperous, and happy uh, person. A man who is always suspicious, never trusting anything or anybody, can never again, never again anything worthwhile. So I'm saying that I know people in my family that uh, uh, adopt children and uh, somehow uh, they have this, this lack of uh, self-love because, uh, because of this principle. You know, I was not loved by my own mother. You know, she, she abandoned me. She gave me away. And then the person is always suspicious. He never trusts anybody else. Uh, I have someone in family. You know, they cannot trust their uncles or anything. They're always like that because, you know, the, the basic, the most fundamental trust you know, uh, with the mother and the father is not there. Confidence holds the world and nourishes the world. How can a babe thrive if it has no confidence in its mother? You know? it, is, it is very difficult situation. How can a lover gain pleasure if he does not trust his beloved? And furthermore, so how can the lover be really open to the extent of, uh, of having a beautiful uh, <clears throat> intimate, uh, intimate uh, act with one's beloved if there is no trust? Uh? Similarly, how is the aged parent to be happy who has no confidence in his sons? Would the, the, you would, would the husband man till the land? So this is a farmer. Would a farmer till the land if he had no confidence? So mutual distrust will put an end to all initiatives. You know, I, I do a little bit of a, of a garden here, no? vegetable garden, I think. So we do it and uh, we, we have to have trust that maybe, you know, circumstances are going to be favorable. And I'm going to to, yeah, to reap some uh, benefits from this work. But uh, we know that there are many factors. But uh, we don't trust nobody does anything because everybody does what does, you know, uh, because it wants to accomplish a certain result, a certain goal. But by and by, people understand that the, the accomplishment of the goals uh, is not a certain thing. You know, I mean, I, I'm never sure when I'm going to succeed in my with my effort, but yet we need to have this this trust in life, and do what we do until we get to understand that there is uh, there is Ishwara, uh, the sum total of all factors that delivers us the result. You know? Daivan, <clears throat> Daivan is this angle of Ishwara as the the sum total of all factors that bring about our results. So confidence, trust has to be there in life. Trust, ultimate distrust has to go to God as we grow up spiritually. How can humanity exist without universal trust? Shraddha, if you should say, on the other hand, that it is the law of cause and effect. I will tell you, listen to me, because some people who say, how can humanity exist without this universe trust in God? 
He said, there is no God. There is just phenomenal and everything is affecting and causing effect, cause and effect, cause and effect. You know, the world moves like that, matter and impacting energies and so on and producing all this phenomena. There is no God involved and there is no need for trust. Why? Because this is not an intelligently structured universe. And Vedanta proves to us, no, you can trust because there is a structure. This structure is made out of knowledge, pure knowledge, pure intelligence. And we understanding this, and then we become a Kami Yogi, and we grow very, very quickly. But uh, some people say, okay, no, there is no question of a Shraddha or trusting God because everything happens by accident. Yeah? And just, you know, whatever. Uh, but Mark knows well that there are some, some principles, some rules, some, some, <clears throat> some laws that, that allow him every year to, to get his seeds and plant and take care and so on, observing different factors as one grows with this knowledge. Né? And then he can expect a certain result, but he's not in control over the result. Isn't it, Mark? So you never know. No? But there is trust behind all transaction. There is a trust that if I if I do properly things dynamically and so on, I may achieve my desired goal. If uh, if that is meant to be my parabda karma, of course. So the if you believe it's cause and effect, listen to me. People believe in the law that such a cause produce the results. But even this belief is fate. Huh? And now she brings a law. So if you believe everything is cause and effect, you know, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, you say, okay, but then you have faith in cause and effect. So you are saying that everything is accidental, it's cause and effect, and so on. And uh, But uh, it takes faith, confidence in this fundamental law. Cause and effect is a fundamental law. But the only thing missing here is that uh, it's not a, a, a kind of a, a unorganized, unstructured and uh, uh, cause and effect, okay? It's not accidental. No, everything consistently follows its nature, as we know. The, the, the fire is always going to be hot and so on. So we can expect a lot of things understanding the fundamental nature of all these things. Yeah? And then uh, we understand cause and effect, but we understand the laws and principles uh, sustaining this universe by which causality is the most fundamental law. Yeah? Everything is causing an effect and changing the environment, producing uh, new effects. The effects becomes other cause, you know, but that's why we say it's not a linear thing, cause and effect, it's cyclical. Yeah? A man will not dare to breathe in the absence of faith for the fear of pathogenic infection and consequence illness and, and death. Therefore, believe before you aspire for moksha, the supreme beatitude. So she say, even, even the fact that uh, uh, we are not afraid of, of breathing in and out is a demonstration that we trust life. We trust that Ishwara has made us in a, well, <clears throat> in a way, put us in a certain environment, and we can nearly every day go to sleep knowing that the air is going to be available, what is going to be available, you know, and everything I need. And, uh, and I should not die unless I'm extremely old during my sleep, which is a death desired by many. Huh? So we can expect things huh? that uh, I can breathe. I can do my things. I can stand up knowing that there are some principles and, and, and uh, structuring the day to day so that I can do actions to gain certain results. You understand? So if there was no structure, structure, nobody would do anything. 
because uh, you know tomorrow the sun we decides to go for vacation. So just imagine if the sun would take a vacation from time to time, uh, three four times a year. Never telling people when he's going to take three days vacation or two days or even one day, and then you know all our crops would fail and everything would be a total chaos. Now, but no, we, we know that we can trust this structure and it is beautifully, intelligently uh, designed. Therefore, yeah, revisit your assumptions and uh, believe, yeah, believe, trust what I'm telling you before you even aspire for moksha because I don't want to waste my time. If again, Prince, you hesitate to depend on an incompetent person, as you think you may think to me, me to be, that is because you believe that a certain end must be accomplished. Now she presents another logic to him. So even if you are hesitating, you are not really putting your trust on me. You are considering that maybe I'm incompetent. You are doing that. Why? Because you want to accomplishing a certain goal. There is an end to be accomplished, which was wisdom, knowledge, self-knowledge, liberation. So now you are, you are somehow looking at the situation and says, is she my guru? Is she really the best possible guru? So he understands yeah, that there is a certain trust there. And uh, it is the accomplishment and uh, he's using he's using his judgment, but it's a poor judgment because uh, he was not able to understand the teachings before she unfolds. Now, uh, então, or anything that we desire, we desire by means of trust that that can be gained. And he's trying to check if she's she is a good guru or not. So, but there is a trust that there is an end game here. There is an end accomplishment. So there is no way you can you can achieve your desired goal without trust, and uh, you are demonstrating it. I trust in this desired goal. I'm just checking if my wife Hemaleka is a proper guru here. Hemashuda said after hearing to his beloved's arguments, he said, uh, "If fate should be placed in anyone, my dear wife, it should certainly be placed on those who works of it in order that one's ends may be served. So he is still uncertain. He who is bent on the highest good should never trust an incompetent person. Otherwise, he comes to grief like a fish attracted by the tempting bait at the end of the fishing line. So. Therefore, faith can only be put in the worse and not in the unworse. So this is a valid argument. So we know that uh, in the spiritual world, there are a lot of uh, uh, untrust worse uh, gurus uh, ready to take advantage of people uh, who do not have uh, this viveka, enough discrimination to understand a good guru from uh, a, a false guru. Yeah? So on the other hand, the ultimate trust, as we have already established, is a, is a trust towards the, the teachings, the scriptural knowledge, the teachings. And Hemaleka was unfold the teachings that is not really her teachings. The thing about Vedanta, the beauty about Vedanta is that the teacher does not have his own teaching. And then the student, yeah, the, the, the thicker of moksha do not have to have this problem. So am I going to trust this guy? Yeah. Uh, so let me check. Let me see. You know, let's see if his teaching, his teaching, his expositions are in line with the scriptural knowledge. So I put it to the test because uh, uh, I heard or I understood that there is this uh, revealed knowledge which is not personal. It was not uh, uh, originate by any mind, okay? And uh, let me see if this is a good guru. Yeah? So, but most people do not have this understanding and then we have to go there like a blind person somehow, you know, touching and trying to find our way through the, the, the spiritual uh, 
world. Huh? But uh, uh, it's my understanding that uh, we always get the guru we deserve. And every guru serves a certain purpose. It's like a, a leading arrow. Huh? Oh, I got this guru. Ooh, it was good for a while, but then I need to move into another guru. But it was not a waste. I got the guru I deserved. It is just uh, like yoga, leading arrow. And then slowly, slowly, you know, I found my way. And then I come to the Upanishads and, and the, the Gita. Né? So how are we going to place our faith on someone? That is his question. I have to be very careful. A fish put his faith on the whatsoever is there at the end of the line. Né? And then he's finished. Okay? It's attractive. You know, you go into these such sanghas in which there is a lot of attraction, a lot of uh, shakti, a lot of... Uh, Posiness of a sangha, you know, and you you were there. It's a tempting bite, yeah. And then uh, and then you're gonna you're gonna be stuck with that for some time. And then very rarely someone is going to be destroyed by that kind of experience. But some people they they suffer some loss. I know a few people who suffered a lot of uh, financial loss, giving everything to certain uh, gurus or ashrams. You know? So the point here is, uh, I have to be careful. I, I should not put my trust blindly on someone who may prove to be incompetent. Yeah? The faith can only be put in someone who is worth it. Fishes and all those men who have ruined themselves in the one way and prospered in the other can verify my statement. Yes, you have to be very careful. In the business world, so, oh, I have a partner now. You know, it's a 50-50 partnership. So be careful. You need to really uh, choose carefully your, your, your partner. Huh? Why? Because uh, you never know. You're going to need to make a judgment. Can I really trust this person? Absolutely trust this person. So, so if you don't have that discrimination, which is not easy, huh? we may go and have certain experience, but then the laws of karma resolve everything in the end. So I got the experience of being cheated by my partner, which is part of the process as well. <clears throat> I can only believe you, therefore, after a full certain ascertainment of your worth, not otherwise. Now, this was heavy, he says, I'm not sure about your worthiness, and I, I can't believe you like that. So what you gave me, what you provide me is not enough evidence for the trust I should have in you. I'm sorry, I mean, don't take it personally, but you know, the world is danger. There are a lot of people that, you know, may be deceiving you, putting up a face of uh, trustworthiness. Why then do you ask me if the desired end can be approached. Okay. Why then do you ask me if the desired end can be approached? She asked in the verse 32. Yeah, was the last thing she, she said. <clears throat> so even if you don't trust me, it's because you trust your judgment, because you trust something. Uh, uh, as uh, moksha and self-knowledge and moksha. There is a trust there at play. So otherwise, no desire can be accomplished or, or the end desire cannot be approached. So he, he, then he reminds her of that and says, why then do you ask me if the desire end can be approached? After hearing him, Himalaya replied, listen, Prince, to what I'm going to say now. I answer your point. How is one to judge whether one is good or bad? Is it by reference to acceptable, accept standards? What is the authority behind such standards? Are the authors themselves worse or unworse? And worse? Is this way, in this way, there will be no end to argument? So this is something that uh, we we know by first-hand experience in life. Yeah? 
So I have my Viveka, I have my, my ability with some sativa operating my mind to make a reading of the situations and, and judge people and circumstances and, and so on, you know, make my judgments. And, uh, but there are no standards. I mean, when I see certain situations, certain people claiming this and that, there are no standards to say, okay, under these standards, those claims are correct under this and that uh, circumstance. So uh, there are no standards, even if there will be some standards be to, to define, to help you to determine what is good and what is evil, you know, what is truthful and what is lie. You would have to trust the standard, but you have to trust the authorities behind the standard, which you never know. Yeah? You, and then you would have to analyze and see the authors of them somehow uh, worse and worse of our trust. In this way, there will be no end to the argument. So after all, we are left with our own Viveka, our own sense of, uh, of discrimination, discernment and trust. So, and, and that's all we have, basically, you know? Because even for us to come to the point of trusting uh, the scriptures, the revealed scriptures, okay? We need to, to develop a lot of uh, uh, assessments or determinations or discernments so that brought me to, okay, now I believe that the, the scriptures are trustworthy, okay? but not necessarily these or their gurus with their own teachings. Yeah? So uh, there is no end. How, how I'm going to be sure that my wife, Hamaleka, is, is worth my trust, my shrader, my full uh, trust, yeah? my faith in her. So how am I gonna know where I'm gonna go, what books I'm going to use to help me to make this determination? No, he has to do it. <clears throat> somehow. Moreover, the observer's competence must be taken into account. So if you don't have standards, if you have some standards, nothing is going to give you full certainty of those standards, the people who create them, the base. And then moreover, I have to, to, to take the observer's competence, my mind. I ob I'm observing these, I'm observing the standard and so on. And depending on my mind, my capacity as the observer, the one who is doing this, you know, it has to be taken into account, you know? There is no end to it. Therefore, life moves by faith alone. So she's presenting an argument. If you want to have an absolute free faith, free of any possible risks, you are never going to make a moving life, okay? Because, uh, I mean, we are not omniscient. We don't have the mind of Shwara who knows everything. We, we, we just make a decision, as I often say, uh, knowing perfectly well that you don't have a crystal ball, and, uh, but you don't need to regret if it, in the end, proves to be uh, not a good decision. You understand? You do your best. So we are not Shwara's mind. Huh? So we don't move in life unless we. We just uh, trust, trust this movement of life that gradually produces in us this discrimination, this discernment. But we should know all the time that uh, nothing is sure, nothing is 100% uh, guaranteed, you know? So otherwise I don't move. Oh no, I'm not going to go and start relate to my new neighbor here because uh, I, I haven't really done a, a full investigation, you know, going through all the records of that family to be sure that uh, it is a, a good association. Now, it may take months until with the help of people find out no, in the sun and geez, in the, any crime, any, you know. So no, you, you want to live life. You just go and move and trust and then keep exercising your Viveka. And then you see where it all takes us. I shall explain to you the rationale of reaching the supreme goal of moksha by means of faith. Now she's going to teach faith, now trust, shraddha. Be attentive. People will not gain anything either during their lifetime or after death 
by endless doubts, discussions, or blind acceptance, okay? So it's very interesting here because here she puts blind acceptance is also not completely good, okay? So most of all trust is a little bit blind, but it should not be completely blind, okay? So <clears throat> if we don't, there are people who will not get anything unless yeah, by, by keeping this attitude of mistrust, this life or, or future life, if they are stuck on the fence, having discussions and having a difficult to jump into the flow of life and take its risk, okay? Or the ones who are blindly accepting, trusting everything also gets in a, to a lot of trouble as well. So are we on the same page? Are you following? So either way, if you, you stay stuck on the, on, the, on the fence, not make a move because there is potential for mistake, or if you go with any impulse, either way, it is not the best way. No? And then she says, but of the two, the blind acceptance is better than to be paralyzed. Very interesting, huh? So she says, if you have an uh, attitude of uh, argument, inner argument, discussions with yourself before you make every step in life, you are in a worse situation than jumping, accepting, trusting any movement of life. Huh? And we understand that because to be paralyzed does not provide with us with the opportunity of learning from our mistakes. Huh? Therefore, of the two, however, the blind acceptance, the blind faith, the blind trust is better. There is hope for this one, and there is no hope for the one who is stuck with, uh, with analyzing the situation and never moving on. Huh? And then she presents him with a following anecdote. But to illustrate this point, once there, there lived a saint by name Kausika on the Sahia hill near the banks of the river Godavari. He was serene, pure, pure, having knowledge of the supreme truth. Several disciples attended on him. So he has several disciples. He was a good guru, very respectful, respected. And once, when the master had gone out, the disciples started to discuss philosophy according to their own lights. So the guru was not there, and then they start playing arguments in terms around the philosophy of self-inquiry and self-knowledge. There appeared on the scene a Brahmin of great intellect and wide, wide learning, Songa, by name, who successfully refuted all their arguments by his skill in logic. So there was a good guru, several disciples, and then comes a Brahmin, walks in, the guy is very brilliant, he presents pure logic, but the logic is dry. But uh, with logic, he, he, he could receive the logic of the students, of this guru. He was a man without any faith and without conviction, but he was a great debater. Yeah? It reminds me of my first guru. Uh, he lived in India. On those days, there were debates were the, the, the best uh, entertainment in town. They used to go to the... the the central part where there is a park or something like that. And then there were debates, philosophical debates, spiritual, religious debates and all these things. And he says that he used to be so good as a debater that he would go there and say, I'm going to debate on this, on this subject and I'm going to debate against it. And then he would win. And then passing a few days, he would go there and say, I'm going to debate again on this one here but uh, I'm going to debate 
for it rather than against it. And he would win again because it's not about the truth. It is about your ability to, to manipulate logic, you know, and somehow uh, convince others of your logic. Yeah. He was a man without faith and without conviction, but an able debater. Then, when they said that the trust must be ascertained by reference to some student, when the students say, yes, yeah, so you have to trust, but you need to look into some certain student, standard. And then he said, but on what base yeah, these standards are going to be uh, taken, you know? And then he presents very base and uh, refute them all, saying that in any case, none of these students can be really trustworthy, okay? For the sake of, uh, of faith and shrader. Huh? How are you gonna trust this or that person, okay? There is no base on which you can really trust. And he rounded off his speech with the following. Listen, you Brahmins, the standards, are not applicable for ascertaining merits or demerits, and so arriving to shudder in respect to people or situations or scriptures or philosophies. For erroneous standards are not good as tests. So these standards are not uh, flawless to begin with. To start with, their corrected, correctness must be established. Other standards are required to check the correctness of the of certain standard. So, and then it we go into uh, infinito, now, and then the other standards must check them. Are they in their turn infallible? Proceeding in this way, no finality can be reached. Therefore, there is no way for you to have a test, a standard test to see if you can trust or not trust this or that person. A certain of truths being impossible without being test, nothing can therefore be the truth. And say, so if you cannot for sure yeah, uh, come to a certain of what is truth, and then truth is non-existent. Are you there with me? Or it seems that your images have stopped. Hello? We're here, Arlindo. Okay. okay, because your image has frozen. Yes. <clears throat> so he was proving that uh, if, uh, if you can never uh, uh, assess the truth and establish it by logic based on on some standards you know that uh, are, are trustworthy and reliable if none of these can can prove the truth and then the truth is non-existence because uh, the truth is a truth only if it can be proved can be proved to be the truth and we can never you know, determine that by ourselves yeah you know? and we know the truth can never be reached and established unless we understand that we are the truth. Therefore, no tests are possible. Nothing, therefore, is the truth. This enunciation itself cannot be true, nor the enunciator either. What then is the decision arrived at? That all are nothing but void. Okay, there is no truth, there is no self, the only reality is that nothing really is the void. And then he say, this too, the, 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 uh, the establishment that the only reality is the, the void, the, the not self, the non self, the non existence, uh, that cannot be supported as well uh, by no reliable facts. Okay, hence the statement that all is non-existent and not all is the reality a void is reality is also false so he destroyed he ate up all arguments in, in even from the the, the world of uh, buddhism you know the idea that the self there is a self and the self is full and there is no self because the only reality is the not self the absence of self the void you know
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hear so me? this this guy is really Mister. <laughs> He's got nothing. Everything is just all adds up to nothing but his polemics. All he does, he loves arts. He really does love the truth. Yeah, yeah, but he had he had his point there. Nothing can be proved in in objective. Uh, if we want to determine things, you you do that by by the power of uh, your intellect and observing phenomena. But the only truth you don't find in phenomenal object. That's the bottom line. So the scripture refers to the the to the absolute truth, which uh, liberates the 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 Jivatma, yeah? but this truth is not subject to to discussions in in a, in an objective way so but uh, how are we going to develop the trust in the scripture is all to get the point here okay it's not by by getting validation from other sources or other standards but uh, it is something that resonates with that which is the truth which is your very uh, uh, Sachitananda, your very existence, your very consciousness resonates, and then you feel like now there is a truth. This this scripture refers to something which seems to be uh, my end, uh, my end desire here. I want to find the truth, and it says to begin with that I am the truth. So I want to know uh, what is the self, okay? Rather than say that there is no self. So of course there is self, there is existence here. I want to know. And then the scripture says that you are the limitless self. Hearing his, his discourse, some of the students were impressed by the force of Songa's logic and became scholiast of the void. They got lost in this, in the maze of their philosophy. They got lost. The discriminating students yeah, amongst those who heard, place went back to the guru when Songa came back and placed the, 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 the happening to him. And, uh, and then the guru saved them from great trouble by enlighten, enlightening them. Yeah? Thus they gained peace and happiness. Therefore, Hemashuda, be aware about with arid polemics rating as logic you know? use it in the manner in which the holy books have done that way lies salvation this is very nice this brings even more clarity to what i'm trying to convey here <clears throat> be aware of, uh, of being in the position of not trusting anything that is going to paralyze you and going to make you uh, 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 dry academic uh, uh, scholar, okay? Talking about everything and, and having your own convictions demolished by other logics. So it's a very arid land in which trust is not possible to, to grow. Yeah? But it does not say that, uh, that the intellect and the logic should never be used. It says what? Don't go in philosophical logic which is a construct by the human mind, follow the logic, which is not a construct of human mind, but it's a logic present in the light of the teachings. So it does not discard the logic. Vedanta is an exposition of the logic. The logic, the logic is, is based on our experience, which are not properly examined, okay? And it is absolutely there, revealed to us, by Shwara, through the scriptures, receivers, the wishes receive them. So use the light of the logic, the, the logic uh, of the holy books. Huh? So don't believe that logic does not have its place. It has, but uh, use it in the manner in which the scriptures have presented to you. That way only light is salvation because the prop, the prop, the Vedanta is not a philosophy because it's not a mental 
uh, <coughs> human beings uh, philosophy constructed by thought, okay? It is, uh, it is an analysis of experience presented by the scriptures. And then a lot of these analysis can be very subtle <coughs> that escapes our, our, our sense perception and even the mind yeah, that coordinates all of that. It requires a lot of inference. It appears as to be intellectual knowledge, but it's not, okay? But it has a lot of logic. There is a lot of, lot of intellectual activities there so that we can understand yeah, the final uh, salvation pointed by the scriptures on self-knowledge and moksha. Okay, so we're going to stop here. We are over the time. And... Uh, I hope you enjoy better the text. It's getting more interesting. I found this, this uh, passage on, uh, on Shraddha very important to be understood. Yeah? Are we there? My signal is very bad. I, I, I did not realize before that your pictures were frozen. Otherwise, I would have turned to the other provider. Yeah, I know, Linda. Thank you. Okay, uh, Liam, can you finish today? We saw. <clears throat> well, we saw a poor Namada. Poor Namada, poor Namidam, poor Nat, poor Namutachate, poor Nasya, poor Namadaya, poor Nameva Vishite. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Thank you, Lon. Thank you. Beautiful your pronunciation. And I really appreciate it. Namaste. We meet again this coming Monday. Okay. Thank you, Arlindo. Lovely satsang. Thank you.